Buenos dias. Hoy es el Domingo de Paz. Today is Peace Sunday. On a weekend when we celebrate a country that we love, we also hold fast to our faith in a humble God incarnate who showed us the way of peace. It's a day of lament for the unjust systems that pervade our world. And it's a day of hope in God's justice. Today, we cry out to God. Today, we stand up and we boldly proclaim that God created each and every human being in the divine image. Dios te creó a imagen de Dios. We proclaim that our allegiance to Jesus is our highest calling. By choosing to be part of the family of God, you have chosen to be part of something so much bigger than yourself. So join together this morning, trusting that there is so much love gathering in community today. Bring your Bibles, your other symbols of worship, your coffee, your lament tools to this virtual worship table. Please join me in the call to worship. Today's was inspired by Mary's song. Children of God, come. Our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. Come and worship the one who scatters the proud, brings down the powerful, lifts up the lowly, and fills the hungry. God helps us and remembers us from generation to generation. Please join in singing hymn number 371, 
Let there be light, Lord God. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit filled Zechariah as he prophesied these words. We hold fast to them today as we come into prayer. This is a reminder that this worship service is pre-recorded, so please remember to check your email today. That will have updated prayer concerns on it. Join me in this prayer, which is a combination of hymnal worship book number 732 and the Lord's Prayer. And when we get to the Lord's Prayer, please say it in whatever your heart language is, including whatever words you learned this prayer in or you want to say it in. Join me in praying this prayer together. Liberating God, your son taught us to pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let justice roll like a river and righteousness like a never-ending stream. Let your will be done. Let those who mourn be comforted, and those in bondage be set free. Strengthen our hope in you, O God, as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join now in singing number 68 in the purple Sing the Story book, Kyrie Eleison. Amen. Mm-hmm. 
Children, some of you may remember a guy named Salmo from a year or so ago. Well, he's back today, today in a Zoom conversation with Malachi. So get ready to learn from Salmo while we sing a song of lament. Sing the journey 66, if the war goes on. If the war goes on and the children die of hunger and the old men weep, for the young men are no more and the women learn how to dance without a partner who will keep the score. Hello there, Salmo. Thanks for joining me today on my weekly Zoom show, Zoom show, Cues from K's. How are you doing, Salmo? Great. Writing psalms as usual, and I'm so happy to join you on your Zoom show. As you know, on Cues from K's, we take questions from kids. And so there are a few questions from my audience I'd like to ask you. That sounds great. I'm happy to answer the best that I can. Great. First question, Salmo. You have an interesting name. What does that mean, or how did you get that name? Well, for as long as I can remember, I like to write psalms. This book is full of psalms that I've written, like the kinds in the Bible. And so people simply call me Psalmo. Uh, psalms are simply prayers to God. Uh, sometimes it helps me tell God thanks for the blessings that I've received, or helps me to express my joy. Uh, when I look around and see God's beautiful creation, or when I see people treating each other nice. And so I like to write about these times and prayers to God. Next question, Salmo. You said you like to write your prayers to God when you were thankful or joyful. Do you ever have times when you're feeling down, not smiling, or angry or annoyed? Oh, yes, I do. I certainly have those days when I'm not feeling my happy self. Perhaps some of your audience members uh, have those kinds of days when they're sort of grumpy or not feeling very well. Uh, maybe they're angry uh, because someone at school or a brother or a sister was mean to them. Or maybe they get sad because their favorite toy broke. Well, I have those days too because someone didn't treat me very nice or I look around and I see people mistreating each other and not being very nice to each other on the playground, or when I see people litter and throw their garbage around. Oh yeah, I have those days when my smile turned upside down into a frown. Salmo, what do you do when you have those frowny days? Well, I do what I always do. I write those times down to God as a way of praying to God. Though God likes it when I write about my happy times, uh, God also wants to hear about my frowny times. And in the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms, there is a special name for the kinds of prayers we cry out to God when we are sad or angry or annoyed. Do you know what those prayers are called? Wait, I'm the one who's supposed to be asking the questions here. But to answer your question, no. I don't know what those prayers are called when I'm feeling sad, angry, or annoyed. Well, those prayers are called laments. These are a special kind of prayer that helps me, or rather all of us, to pray to God when we're not feeling very happy. In fact, laments have a kind of movement when you pray them. Most laments have three steps. The ah phase, the 
O phase and the ah phase. Why don't you repeat after me? Say ah. Uh. Oh. Oh. Ah. Uh. Well, your ah is a little weak, but that's okay. You can work on that. These are the three parts of a lament prayer. The ah uh part is when God invites us to honestly tell God how we feel. God, I'm sad because someone hurt my feelings. God, I'm angry when I see people mistreat each other. God, I'm upset when I see people throw trash on the ground. That's the err uh, phase. The O oh phase is the second part. It's when we suddenly remember that God helped us in some other time when we were feeling frowny or angry. We remember how good it felt when someone came and wiped away our tears or someone cheered us up by playing a game with us. The O oh phase is the second part of lament. Finally, there's the ah phase. It's when our tears are wiped away and we aren't so frowny anymore. It's when we realize that God is in control or that tomorrow will be a better, sunnier day. It's when we say, God, I still might not like what's going on, but I know that you are present with me and will help me. That's the ah phase. So that's lament. Ah. Oh. Ah. And for me, even though many of these prayers appear to be very short, like six or 10 or 15 verses, we don't know how long it took these people to write their prayers. Maybe it took them many days or weeks or months or even years to write all three steps of their prayer. Maybe they wrote the err uh, phase and set it aside until later they could be at a time when they felt like, oh, yeah. And then maybe they wrote and set it aside again until they were at a place where they could go, ah. After all, it's kind of hard to go from ah to ah in two minutes. But remember, God wants to hear from us, not just when we're feeling happy and joyful, but especially when we are a bit frowny and sad. Thank you so much, Salmo, for telling me and my audience on cues from Chase about the prayers of lament. One last question. I hear you are a football fan. Which is the greatest football team of all time in the NFL? Oh, my, my young friend. That's simple. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers, of course. That's actually incorrect. Well, perhaps I can fight you again on cues from Chase next time so we can debate that. Thank you again for your time, Salmo, and have a good day. Well, friends, I'll see you again next week on Cues from Kids. Till next time, stay safe and be well. If the war goes on and the truth is taken hostage and new terrors lead to the need Patriotic who'll expose the lies. If the war goes on and the daily bread is terror and the voiceless poor take the road as refugees when a nation's pride destines millions to be homeless who will heed their pleas if 
the war goes on, will we close the doors to heaven? If the war goes on, will we breach the gates of hell? If the war goes on, will we ever be forgiven? If the war goes on. David Maldonado, our, one of our pastors for Outreach, will be preaching the sermon today. Join me in prayer. God, thank you for creating David in your image. Thank you for his curiosity and for the honest way that he reads your scriptures and seeks to know you better. I pray that your spirit will be upon him as he preaches this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Gird your loins, God would often say to the prophets, when the conversation would be a weighty one. Now, I know that this isn't a conversation because you won't be speaking back to me. But this morning, I would say, gird your loins. I want to speak on the title, Our Fathers. Lamentations, chapter 5, verse 7. I'm going to read from two versions. The first one is the NASB, and the second one is the NIV. Our fathers sinned and are no more. It is we who have borne their iniquities. Our ancestors sinned and are no more, and we bear their punishment. So those are the two versions. In this book, we look at Jeremiah. And I'm looking at Jeremiah's lament. What caught my attention is he makes reference to our fathers. He is saddened because of the condition of Israel, the destruction that came upon them. And he's lamenting. And he was thinking about what life was like prior to what it is when he lamented. So he talks about all that, but then at the end, we find this verse tucked away in there. He says, our fathers, when I read our fathers, I'm thinking about the previous generation, the people who made decisions before Jeremiah. And he says, they sinned. I look at sin as something that's morally deficient. How so? This is a decision or an action that is not to the standard of God. God has revealed his standards of morality, justice, and holiness. Anything below those standards is sin. The interesting thing about this is God expects each and every human to abide by these standards. And that is why when we go to the Old Testament, it's interesting that the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, would go to the neighboring king and call them out. Now, how dare the Hebrew prophet go to a different land and call out a king based on the standards of the Hebrew revelation because God expects all humanity in whatever generation, whatever time, whatever country to abide by those standards. So he says, our fathers sinned and are no more. They're dead. 
but they're present. You see, people die, but what they did, their decisions, their actions live on. They carry on. They move on. They're still with us. Many years ago, I read a book titled The Seven Dead People Who Speak from the Grave. One of them is Darwin. So he's dead, but his teachings still govern different people's minds. So he's dead, but he's alive in a sense. So they are no more. Their legacy in Jeremiah's mind is a sin legacy. That's not a good thing to be reminded by. So let's, let's not leave that legacy behind. It is we, he says, the living who must muddle through the effects of their decisions. I learned that word at many years ago in Pennsylvania at Mennonite Central District or something along that name. I forget the name of that place. And uh, I had two years in the pastorate, and so they flew me in from Florida, and I met other fledgling ministers, and we saw what the Mennonite church did, and we visited some large warehouses where there's uh, clothes and canning of food, and, and so they shared with us all a lot of stuff. And then um, we had a teaching, and in that teaching, she introduced this word, muddle through. And it's, it has stayed with me for 32 years. So Jeremiah is saying, our father sinned. They're not here, but we, the ones who are alive, we have to live through this. We have to muddle through all these bad decisions that have been made, and now we inherit all of this mess, all this destruction, all this nonsense is ours now to deal with. Now I want to talk about our fathers in reference to the founding fathers. The founding fathers of the United States, or simply known as founding fathers, were a group of American leaders, some say seven, some say eight, some say 10, some say 12. It doesn't matter. I'm just making reference to them. Who built a frame of government for the fledgling United States. So we have a group of men who are referred to in many circles, especially academic circles, political circles, as the founding fathers. And these founding fathers framed a, a, a way to move forward these uh, 13 colonies who are now becoming the United States of America. One of their proclamations is this, or something they believed in. Freedom is not a gift bestowed upon us by men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. I mean, that sounds beautiful. <laughs> Freedom is yours because God gave it to us. It's not yours because a man says it's yours. That's beautiful. And yet, one of those founding fathers, I'm not going to get into all of them, but one of them, Jefferson owned slaves. He did not believe that all were created equal and was willing to profit from slave trade. So follow that. He's part of that group that believes in freedom 
but yet he is also part of that group that is building wealth by taking a human and selling it to another human. And yet he believes in freedom. He believes in freedom so much that he's willing to go to war against uh, Great Britain. Jefferson, like all slaveholders and many other white members of American society in that time, regarded Negroes as inferior, childlike, untrustworthy. That's interesting. From a man who says one thing and lives another. And, of course, as property. One who is not willing to be property of another government, but yet owns slaves. Jefferson, the genius of politics, could see no way for African Americans to live in society as free people. The way I see it, government set a tone, an attitude, a standard of behavior that made it acceptable in American society to treat certain people with cruelty. And so the seed was sown and embedded in American institutions. Today we have an uprising with good reason, with very good reason. But these seeds, these, these uprisings, it's, it's not a today thing. It's our fathers sinned. Declare one thing and do the contrary. According to Jesus, this is hypocrisy. To declare one thing and to behave another way, in Jesus' definition, that's hypocrisy. That's sin. I want to share two stories with you. One has to do with one of my sons. I have four sons and one daughter. One of my sons, and I will admit, I was naive. This is the year 2008. I was naive in believing that I was sending my son to a community with similar values as the one we had taught for many years to our children, to the Mennonite congregation where we pastored. So when my son decided to go to Kansas to one of the Mennonite colleges, I assumed that I am sending my son, my 18-year-old boy, to a community with similar values. For, of course, we say we promote peace and we promote justice. We speak loudly about equality. We uh, give money to this. So in my mind, this is a good place for my boy to go. He visited the college. He liked it. He went, um, he was going to play football, be part of the football team. Well, it was all rosy. There, now this I learned years later. My son attended from 08 to 11. He dropped out in his junior year. And I never understood why. I was like, you're so close. You had to finish just one more year and you would have had your accounting degree. And he never shared much with me. So in, in, in 2011, he dropped out. He stayed in Kansas. He took on a, a different path. About seven years later, man, no, no, not that many, five, six years later, he comes back to Florida. I'm still living in Florida. We're still living in Florida. He comes back to Florida. He starts to work with me and as he settles in. So I sat with him and I asked him, why'd you quit? I, I, I'm still, un I don't understand this. He says, let me tell you what it was like. 
He says, as the, the first day as people were moving into the dorm, I sat on the stairs and I said, hello, my name's Jacob. Hello, my name's Jacob. Hello, my name's Jacob. And people would just pass me up and ignore me. Some would just laugh. Some would giggle. I said, really? He said, yeah. That's what it was like. He said, remember that I used to work doing janitorial services in the dorm? I said, yeah. He said, well, they would get toilet paper, wet it, throw it on the walls, and defecate on the floor, and then yell, hey, Mexican, go clean it up. Now, these are good Mennonite white kids from good Mennonite white families from good Mennonite churches. And this is what my son lived. It bothers me that I sent my child to a Mennonite institution to get in debt, to be humiliated, ridiculed by not only his peers, but some professors. That is an extremely sad situation. Years later, my daughter decided to go to another Mennonite college in Kansas, and I was concerned. I did not want the same thing for her, but she went. But this was a better experience. She was accepted. She was embraced. She was looked after at Heston College. And I'm going to tell you what, if ever Michelle Hirschberger listens to this, I give a huge shout out to you. And she represents what our institutions need. She embraced our daughter. She walked with my daughter, just like Jesus would embrace and walk with any human being. And so... Alice had such a great experience there, and I was so thankful that she continued her, her, her studies at EMU, and she continued, now she's continuing to get her master's. But herein lies my point. We must be careful that we do not behave like our fathers. As a Mennonite, denomination, Mennonite congregation, as Mennonites who love peace and justice, we need to be cautious, extremely cautious. So I bring this here and now. Is the Mennonite church free of sins? Has the Mennonite church stayed quiet when it should have raised a banner? Is it enough to talk about something once a year when people deal with it every day? Are not Mennonite institutions guilty of bias, subtle racism, privilege, and these have built systems of inequity. Gird your loins, said the Lord to the prophets. These are things we need to talk about, we need to look at, and we need to address. Many Mennonite institutions are dominated by white culture and privilege. Or is this an exaggeration? Is it enough to have a welcoming statement? Healing must start in the house of God by those known as the children of God. Healing cannot be deferred to the next generation. We can't say, oh, let's just let, let the kids deal with it. That's what Jefferson declared. 
Let, let, the, let the younger ones deal with it. They'll, they'll get rid of um, the slave trade. But for now, for right now, we're making good money. Let's leave it the way it is. No, the church cannot behave that way. We need to recognize, we need to name it, confess it, and implement immediate change. I close with this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Our decisions today, today, will weigh upon the next generations. May our legacy be different than our fathers. I invite you to hymn 136 from the depths of sin. Happy New Year. This is the first day of our new fiscal year. We do want to thank you today for all of your generosity in the 2019-2020 year. We have no idea what all 2020 to 2021 will hold, but we do know that we will continue to be the household of God. We will continue to strive to live out God's justice right here where we are in the situation we find ourselves in. So today, as we head into a new fiscal year, give with joy.
Let us pray and give thanks for the many blessings the Lord gives us. Father, we thank you for your many blessings. And from the abundance we receive, we give back to you. Honor our giving and bless it in the hands of those who manage it. We ask these things in Christ's name. Now I invite you to hymn number 226. You are salt for the earth. are salt for the earth, O oh people, salt for the kingdom of God. Share the flavor of life, O oh people, life in the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy, bring forth the kingdom of peace, bring forth the kingdom of justice, bring forth the city of God. A solid of the word, O oh people, bring forth the kingdom of God. Seeds of mercy and seeds of justice grow in the kingdom of God. Reina la misericordia, reina la paz y el amor, reina perfecta justicia en la ciudad del Señor. We are the blessed and the pilgrim people bound for the kingdom of God. Love our journey and love our homeland. Love is the kingdom of God. Reina la misericordia, reina la paz y el amor, reina la cuenta justicia en la ciudad del Señor. Bring forth the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of peace, bring forth the kingdom of justice, bring forth the city of God. Today, extend peace and welcome to someone beyond our church family. This can be as simple or as elaborate as you want it to be. Greet that person or that household as a citizen of the kingdom of God. As you log out or change the channel, hear these words of benediction. Family of God, we have gathered in hope and in trust. In our distress, God hears our cries. God's steadfast love endures forever. Go in peace. Welcome to What's Growing at CMC, the weekly segment where I, Talasha, and I, Daniel, share some stories of the seedlings God is bringing to life at College Mennonite Church. If you drove by the church this week, you may have noticed new activity in our parking lot. COVID-19 testing began here officially on Tuesday. If you or someone you know needs to get tested, come on by. We are grateful that we can be stewards of this space in this way. The work of the church, of course, looks different right now. But we are settling into a new temporary normal. Community Life Commission has continued to minister to our church family through the Encircling Fund. While we are using the COVID-19 fund extensively right now, the Encircling Fund continues to be relied on for needs that are not as closely linked with this unique time. Thank you for your continued generosity to both of these funds. Community Life Commission has also taken the opportunity to work on some end of life resources. Look on the church website to find new videos from Pamela about dealing with and preparing for death. And they are updating the Dealing with Death booklet. Many in our culture may consider conversation about death to be morbid but death is part of life. Talking about death and preparing for it is part of our faith journey and a gift to those we love. There is a lot to talk about right now. 
We parents find ourselves having difficult and meaningful conversations with our children. We are all experiencing loss. Our current worship series on lament is designed to help us respond in faith to loss. Pamela and Bob Yoder recently led a seminar, a webinar, excuse me, through AMBS called Mourning Our Losses Together During COVID-19, The Good News of Biblical Lament. The webinar maxed out at 500 people and hundreds more were on the waiting list for a recording. If you were not one of the lucky 500, you will find a link to watch the webinar in an email from the church. Don Blosser has also been doing some exciting work recently. He just published a new book titled The Good News According to Jesus. His treatment of Jesus's mission on earth promises to be fascinating. Contact Don if you would like your own copy. As we settle into this new abnormal, we are also attempting to find ways to continue the baptism and membership prep that we put on hold a few months ago. One exciting piece of our work in the last couple of weeks was matching up a faith mentor with a few youth who want to explore baptism. If you would like to walk with a youth or an adult as a faith mentor, now or in the future, please let us know. Esto es la historia, or this is the story, begins its fifth week already. Justin and Stephanie Yoder report that their household is off to a good start. At the end of this, you'll see Stephanie's project thus far. She considers it to be a doodle or coloring page for each story. You'll also get to see several other household projects. And hear Elliot singing the song up through week four with his family project. We are learning that some of our young theologians are wanting to work ahead. Caleb Gnawen looks forward to learning a new song each week and has already memorized the big song through week six. We share stories of what others are doing to help you inspire each other. But remember that you can enter this from wherever, however, and whoever you are. Learning the song each week is enough. Reading the story each week is enough. Setting aside time each week to step into God's story is important. And that in itself is enough. We miss seeing you here in this space. But we are learning to imagine you through the camera lens, <laughs> to look here and see you, the people we have come to know and love. We also are, are aware that we don't know all of you who are becoming part of this family of faith. There's only so much tracking we can do, but we know that last Sunday, 443 devices watched live through the website. Devices. Now in our house, that's four people for one device. So even with that tracking number, we have no idea how many people are actually tuning in. We do know that number includes people from at least 23 states and five countries. We don't know how many more of you watched the Spanish translation on Facebook. Or watched at Greencroft on Channel 13. Or listened on the radio. We've heard from a few virtual attenders who consider CMC to be your church during this time. We love getting those cards and emails from you. And we would love to hear from more of you. We are grateful to all who are joining us for worship each week. The church continues to grow and change and learn. God was, God is, and God will be. Thanks be to God. and sowing, planting and hoeing, there's something showing, popping up through the sod. The Spirit's blowing, new life we're knowing, giving and growing in the garden of God. Reaping and sowing, planting and hoeing, 
There's something showing, popping up through the sod. The spirit's blowing, new life we're knowing, giving and growing in the garden of God. and sowing, planting and hoeing, there's something showing, popping up through the sod. The spirit's blowing, new life we're knowing, giving and growing in the garden of God.